The name of the demon Karanzan might not be as familiar as Satan, Lucifer, or Beelzebub, but the demon, first summoned by occultist Aleister Crowley, is every bit as evil. Today on Scream to Scream, we're going to summon the true story of Karanzan. Before we do that, make sure you subscribe to Graveyard Shift and let us know in the comments which true life ghost stories you'd like us to cover in the future. Like most demons, Karanzan is thought to be an immortal creature. Yet he wasn't described in writing until the 16th century. This first account came from English mathematician, alchemist, and occult philosopher John Dee and English occultist and spirit medium Edward Kelly in a discussion of the angelic tongue, the language of the angels, today referred to as Enochian. The pair supposedly summoned the archangel Gabriel to answer their questions. When asked if anyone in the world still spoke angelic, Gabriel apparently told them that Karanzan envied God's newest creation man. So just like the serpent in the book of Genesis, the demon worked to drive Adam from the Garden of Eden and into the world, where Adam lost both his innocence and his ability to speak angelic. But being synonymous with the infamous snake in the first book of the Bible wasn't enough for Karanzan. Some followers of the Jewish mystic discipline Kabbalah believe they have an insight into the demon's true nature. Using a gematria system to interpret Hebrew scriptures by assigning numerical values to words, they discovered that Karanzan's name bears the value of 333. They believe that this number, exactly half of the number of the beast, 666, as described in Revelations 13.18, gives Karanzan significance as an aspect of Satan. Karanzan's symbols based on this depiction of 333, illustrated as three triangles, which are of course three-sided, radiating from a central point. The symbols found its way into pop culture works of fiction, and a similar symbol still gets used today to label radioactive materials. But Karanzan is most often associated with the social and religious movement known as Thelema, developed by English mystic and magician Aleister Crowley in the early 1900s. Karanzan reserved his place in the movement by being summoned and battled by Crowley in a dangerous magic ritual in 1909. Thelema blends Egyptian mysticism, Buddhism, and magic into a spiritual philosophy, espousing that there is no god but man. It also employs Crowley's so-called supreme moral code, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Adherents seek to follow their true wills with the ritual practice of magic and often sex magic at the core of the system. To Thelemites, the demon Karanzan is the first and deadliest of all the powers of evil because he is the metaphysical contrary to the whole process of magic. Within Thelema, Karanzan is referred to as the dweller in the abyss. He functions as the sole inhabitant of the chasm human magicians must cross to attain ultimate knowledge. Those prepared to meet Karanzan must also be capable of abandoning their ego if they are to move beyond the abyss. Doing so will grant them the title of Master of the Temple. But those who are not up to the task will find themselves laid waste and subject to spiritual annihilation. Aleister Crowley claims to have met this challenge and won. By Crowley's account, the magic ritual to summon and face down Karanzan occurred on December 6, 1909, in Busada, Algeria. Crowley didn't come alone. Working with him was longtime associate Victor Benjamin Newberg. Crowley took on the submissive role in order to abandon and thus conquer his ego. He then invoked Karanzan by slipping into a trance. The demon did not disappoint, and upon making his presence known, Crowley next began reciting the Call of the Aether. The call is part of Enochian magic, a system of ceremonial magic based on the 16th century writings of John Dee and Edward Kelly, Karanzan's first known summoners. Apparently, the magic worked. Crowley claims that Karanzan was now bound within a triangle surrounded by two magical barrier circles. The magician then entered the Solomonic Triangle and began a lengthy debate and struggle with the demon. At this point, both Crowley and Newberg described Karanzan as changing shape shifting into the form of an old man, a serpent, and finally into Crowley's own likeness. This detail may be telling, as Karanzan was often noted for taking on the likeness of someone his summoner may consider provocative or even alluring. The demon also supposedly took on the form of a French female escort known to Crowley's companion, Newberg, in order to seduce him. Reportedly, the creature's attempts to entrance Newberg failed, as he refused to free the beast bound by the triangle. 
After a lengthy back and forth, Crowley was finally triumphant, writing the name Babylon in the sand with his holy ring to signify that he had now overcome Karanzin. This victory would prove to be significant in Crowley's later development of his Thelemic belief system. In a few short years, the magician would claim to have received the supreme moral law of Thelema from Iwas, the messenger of the Egyptian god Horus. This honor was only possible for Crowley because of his defeat of Karanzin and subsequent achievement of ultimate enlightenment. But while Crowley claimed to have bested the demon, Karanzin was never far from his thoughts. Crowley would often write and speak of the entity he called the Dweller in the Abyss, once stating that the demon was not unlike the abyss he inhabits, a void with no true form of his own. He explained that the demon was not really an individual, even going so far as to call Karanzin empty of being. Instead, Crowley believed the demon to be composed only of possible but unrealized forms, forms with the raging desire to make themselves real. This informed Crowley's belief that Karanzin's function rendered it the diametric opposite of occult magic. Karanzin was, to Crowley, anti-magic, anti-matter, and anti-life, an empty vessel presenting itself as attractive and substantive, or even a spirit guide to enlightenment. But it was all smoke and mirrors. For Crowley, the demon he met and bested was an all-encompassing detrimental force, only seeking to disperse and dissolve anything physical, mental, or spiritual wholly insatiable and forever empty no matter how much it consumed, a black hole with an eating disorder. Crowley's Karanzin despises order, rational thought, and piety. He is also the root of impotence, infirmity, and decay in the body. In the mind, he was to blame for confusion and irrational thinking, but most devastating was that Karanzin festered darkness and despair in the human soul itself. But luckily Crowley had defeated Karanzin, or did he? According to Crowley, in order to overcome the demon of the abyss, a magician must cross the abyss. To do this successfully, one must relinquish everything they have and everything they are, including wealth, health, and love. But if a summoner makes it to the abyss without finding a way to let go of any of these three attachments, they will become what Crowley and his fellow Thelemites called a black brother. A black brother was a compromised individual who was open to demonic possession. Those possessed by Karanzin will believe they are darkness itself, it's said that even those close to someone possessed by Karanzin will feel some of the demon's weakening effects. This sensation is what was described by some of Aleister Crowley's associates later in life. Some apparently believed that the magician was permanently changed by his experience summoning and battling the demon all those years before. Many Thelemites even feared that Crowley had in fact lost the duel with Karanzin, and that Karanzin had been in possession of Crowley ever since that day. Most troubling of all, was that this meant that it was Karanzin, not Crowley, at the helm of the Thelema movement itself. Whether or not Crowley defeated Karanzin, his association with the demon has helped the Dweller of the Abyss raise his public profile considerably. Despite a late start on his competition, Karanzin now has enough pop culture cachet to make Satan start to watch his throne. Karanzin has been the subject of songs from a range of musical acts including Megadeth and Tangerine Dream. But did he also join a musical group? In the late 1980s, musicians Demetria Mon Throm and P. Emerson Williams realized they were both creating experimental music under the name Karanzin. So they decided to not only merge their projects and collaborate, but also to invite a third member in to round out their new power trio. Since it was Karanzin that brought them together, the pair only thought it fitting to invite the demon himself to join their musical project. Supposedly, the demon can be heard speaking in weird, disembodied voices, both male and female, in a number of their albums. Part of these projects center on extending the mythos of Karanzin beyond the Thelemic version. The music group instead prefers a modernized, post-abyss version of the demon, depicting Karanzin as an anti-hero and demigod. Band member Throm even claims to be living in a symbiotic relationship with the demon and links the release of their records to several devastating natural events, including the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake that shook Northern California, as well as Hurricane Katrina in 2005. A much less destructive version of Karanzin is featured in Neil Gaiman's critically acclaimed The Sandman series. Karanzin here is introduced as a High Duke of the Eighth Circle of Hell and appears as a pink-skinned demon with two mouths. Karanzin has since appeared in everything from anime to video games, although he has yet to be featured as a Pokemon. But one of his most widely discussed appearances might not actually have anything at all to do with Karanzin. 
Filmmaker David Lynch's cult TV series Twin Peaks has utilized several strange and ominous symbols throughout its run, and many believe the three triangles of Karanzin to be one of them. On the show, the symbol is associated with the demonic character known as Bob, who terrorizes the namesake town. Bob is known to possess the bodies of others, and the three triangles appear as markings on the skin of several characters during the series. But it's with someone who once looked to possess the role of Bob itself where we find the latest appearance of Karanzin. In 2015, when Twin Peaks was headed back to the small screen, one of the questions was, who was going to play Bob now? The original actor, Frank Silva, died in 1995, and the internet began speculating who could fill his shoes. Rock musician Andrew W.K. made his own pitch to series co-creator Lynch via Twitter, telling him, I'm ready to party, with an accompanying side-by-side -side photo comparison of him and the original actor who played Bob. But while Lynch ultimately chose to use CGI effects to resurrect Bob, this was not the last brush with an aspect of Karanzin for Andrew W.K. On February 17, 2021, W.K. released the video clip for his new single, Babylon. The song's title is given the same spelling as the goddess found in Aleister Crowley's occult system of Thelema. The song also featured occult and Thelemic lyrical content addressing Babylon as the mother of mankind, as well as making reference to the abyss and ego death. But the connection to Karanzin is made clear, well, nearly clear, within the video clip for the song. The clip closes with the coded statement, Consciousness hasn't opened reality, only nightmares zone out now. This statement serves as an acrostic of the word Karanzin. Aleister Crowley considered resisting Karanzin to be a final hurdle to the true understanding of magic. Whether or not anyone else using Karanzin's name agrees with him remains a mystery. In Chapter 66 of The Confessions of Aleister Crowley, he talks in detail about crossing the abyss represented by the demon. He speaks of horrors being faced and mastered and discovering that sorrow has no substance. Crowley says it is only ignorance that has allowed him to imagine the existence of evil, that with his ego expelled, the concept of fear remained only in relation to the idea of I. Crowley believed that so long as one thought of oneself as an individual, as he put it, I am I, all else must seem hostile to that I. But of course, this could just be Karanzin talking. So what do you think? Did Crowley actually defeat Karanzin? Or was the demon in the driver's seat when he founded Thelema? Let us know in the comments below if you have the courage. Like, share, and subscribe for more videos from The Graveyard Shift. And check back next time to find out what else will make it from Scream to Scream.